Welcome to This Human Life with a Philosophical Coach. I'm thrilled to have you tuning in. I'm your host, Sam Kukathis, aka The Philosophical Coach, philosopher, human expert, and high-performance coach. This podcast at its core is about navigating the complexities of being human, whilst providing you the opportunity to go beyond any conception of who you think you are, really. Inside of the freedom that comes from not being attached to figuring out your true purpose, or who you are, is an opening for creating a life free from constraint. If that intrigues or excites you, then you're definitely in the right place. The ideas are drawn from neuroscience, philosophy, my coaching practice, working with elite leaders and experience. You can expect candor, humor, vulnerability, and ideas which are unfamiliar to you, and some you may just plain disagree with. You'll also get the opportunity to hear from inspiring coaches and leaders. Now let's get ready to question what we know. Some of you may have heard me speak about language. You may have heard me speak about language in the first season. And in this episode, I'm going to start to look at language in a deeper way, in a way which really opens up how this can affect the quality of your life. So if you take language seriously, not seriously in terms of a heaviness, but seriously in terms of the power that it has to create your world, then there's an opportunity to revolutionize the way you see life, the way you perceive life, the way you interact with life, the way life occurs moment to moment. There's a way to reduce the significance, to disappear it, to disappear the significance that you've given to language which you've already inherited, or to disappear the significance of the language that you've already brought on for yourself as the truth. And how do I know this? I know this because I've shifted what it looked like for me. I've shifted from a discourse of significance about the discourse around a fixed identity, the discourse of responsibility being about blame and shame and feelings of guilt, the discourse around discipline being something to be like you're being punished to actually seeing it in terms of savoring criticism saving criticism. Why? Because I was living into seeing it as an opportunity to strive for a higher level of excellence. And what would that be like? What would it be like if all of the significance that we've attached to language disappeared? I want to give you on the court examples of what this looks like, but the examples are not going to be sufficient. The the examples are only going to be useful and relevant to the extent to which they open up a world of their own, a distinction of their own, where you see a world in which that world functions for you. And you see a new and get an opportunity to see a new world in which that word functions for you. If you see the word don't have an inherent nature and yet you've given it, that you've been used by that meaning, as if the dictionary is the determinant of the truth of the matter, as opposed to just what's being created in agreement and what's come to have that meaning. Well, then what opens up is this. We start to get present to that there being a sharp distinction between the meaning which we've agreed upon and the truth of the matter. Now, am I saying that agreement isn't important? Absolutely not. But we can take it too far. We can take it too far because it distorts our perception of what reality is. We see through the lens of agreement as if agreement is the same as the truth. When all agreement is built upon a convention, it's built upon the expectation that people will continue to coordinate their conduct and believe that something is so. But what if what if believing that this is so was actually constraining what was possible for you? What if that was stopping you from having what would really be freedom? What would it look like? What would it look like for you to be boundless? I mean, any area of life where you do not experience being unconstrained, where you feel somewhat shackled, those shackles just fell away. All the preconceptions you had about that fell away. And what was created is just a blank space to create your life, to create your business, to create the nature of your work, to create who you are, to create what it is you're living into, to create this moment now, 
now and now and now and to declare what is now is what gives you your power. You're declaring what is now and you're declaring what is now from what is so. You're just getting what is so, you know, not trying to justify, not trying to reason with the circumstance, not trying to explain them away. You're not trying to figure out how to deal with them even. You're just getting. That's what's so. Okay, that's what's so. Now what? And that was famously described as what is so, so what? If what is so is just what is so, then what can you do about it? You can't alter what is so. What is so is just what is so. But there's a place to stand when you get that is just what is so. There's a movement that can be taken. There's a new realm which opens up and see inside of seeing that that is what is so. I've experienced this over and over again for myself, seeing the way in which the shackles which I brought for myself have fallen away in all these different areas of life. Risk, trust, money. These were not words which I used to have any power over. I was shackled. Money was a non-renewable resource. You know, it was clear money didn't grow on trees. It wasn't something which could be created with ease. And inside of that, what was missing was trust. There was no trust in my ability to create money. And it wasn't because I wasn't intelligent. It wasn't because I couldn't get a job. It's because there was something going on about the past. And the past is one way in which I created my experience of money. And I created it in relationship to others. I compared it to my peers. The peers who had stayed in Canberra, worked in public service jobs and built their houses, got married, had families. And there was some small aspect of me which seemed to be longing for that. That was the ability, the freedom to be free and act without constraint inside of money and finances. But there was something which I was also aware of in this time when I wasn't abundant in finances. And that was that I had a unique relationship to money. I didn't need much to build abundance of happiness or abundance of joy or abundance of feeling privileged to live the life that I was. Now, why is that? Because I was just seeing that happiness wasn't based on my level of income. Now, does that mean there isn't some level of income which I was striving to or, or to raise myself to the level to make happiness more attainable moment by moment? Yeah, absolutely there was. But it wasn't the source of whether or not I was happy. That's what I got to choose. I got to choose by discovering where happiness really lied. I started to speak into being happy as a reflection of who I am and who I was. And when I did this, I found myself being knocked back by the experience of discovering it. Not being like, oh, I'm happy. No, it's like I'm skipping down the street. I'm skipping down the street. I'm walking to the train station. I'm listening to music on the way to train with inspiring leaders. And I have the thought, I love my life. Now, if you told, if I told you the amount of money in my account at that time, you might ask, why does he love his life? Like he's only got a few hundred pounds to his name. He's still a student. What's there to love about that? But if you did think that, then what there is to get is that's just how it occurs to you. That's the way it might look from the outside in. But my experience was entirely different. Why? I was creating myself as a leader. I was seeing myself in a new light. I was questioning who I was really. I was questioning what are the limits of what I can provide for us? What is my superpower that I can gift to others? Or what are my superpowers? What are the things that make me unique inside of a world where everyone's unique in some way and everyone is also not? And I was also present to the magic which came from living a life where I wasn't wedded to knowing who I was really. You see, what allowed for that magic was constantly having a drive to peel back the onion, to keep going beyond any conception of who I had previously known myself to be. And then I started stepping into the listening of others who saw me beyond my own conception of myself. And this is something I do 
with the people I work with now. I take on this trait of speaking into someone's greatness because I know what it's like to question yourself. I know what it's like to question when people praise you and to say, is this false? Is this sort of a sort of false compliment? You know, there was a time when, despite my academic background, I didn't see myself as smart. And so I had to start stepping into others listening that I was smart. And I can remember during the early stage of the pandemic, I was speaking with a fellow coach, you know, in a talk around mental health. And when he introduced me, he started listing what I'd accomplished in the realm of academia. And it was literally the first time that I've heard my CV being listed in a way where I was proud. Now that's stunning. I was blindsided to any sense of accomplishment because accomplishment lived out there. It lived with some sort of final end goal as if I hadn't accomplished anything until that point. It didn't matter about the degrees which I already had. What mattered was what I didn't have. Now I invite yourself, I now invite you to look for yourself. Is there anywhere where you have decided that you haven't accomplished something because you're so focused on some end goal and that end goal is what accomplishment is for you. And if there is, I invite you to look. Do you feel this lack of accomplishment because you're continuing to be right that accomplishment is consistent with that outcome. And if you're listening to this and you're wanting to put your hand up and you're saying, that's me, then that's the first step. It's the first step to seeing a new pathway, to seeing new openings for action. And what does that look like? Well, I can tell you what it looks like from an on-the-court experience of shifting how accomplishment occurs, shifting your orientation as a human being around performance into the world of performance. So what it looked like is accomplishment became a daily phenomenon, even an hourly phenomenon, certainly a weekly phenomenon. And it wasn't something which lived out there. It was something which was right now. It's about what's being accomplished right now. And then inside of that, it's what am I creating now? That's what was imperative. That's what shifted the discourse and it shifted my performance. Why? because I became oriented towards accomplishment every day. And so then I was looking at what can I accomplish today? And what am I going to accomplish? Sometimes even speaking to what has Sam accomplished? And I spoke into this is what's been accomplished. Now, this is what I will accomplish. No, it's created as a declaration of what is already so. This is now the future, which is being created inside of my speaking, inside of what I've written, inside of what I've said. And then what? And then you just take actions consistent with reaching that accomplishment. Now, maybe you have a question, but what if I don't actually achieve what I set out to achieve? And so then I feel this lack of a sense of accomplishment. Well, here's the thing. If you're living a big life, that's going to happen. It's going to happen. And the trick here is not to think there's something wrong. The trick here is to, as soon as you see that, as soon as you see that something's not going to get accomplished today or in the moment that you set to get that thing done, you just create another occasion or as many occasions as you need to make it happen so that the future that you have created, the future that you're living into is the one that gets accomplished. Now, I said at the start, I was going to give you examples of how we can disappear the significance that language can play in the quality of our life. And yet these examples are not sufficient for really creating power in our lives. And so I invite you to stay tuned in the next few episodes as I look at the distinction which lies at the core of these examples. And if you're interested in what's coming up next, next week I'm going to carry on seeing how we can disappear the significance we tend to give language by shifting to overwhelm and looking specifically at how we can start to eradicate the heaviness associated with overwhelm.
Whether you're a relative veteran of this podcast or a new listener, I really thank you for taking the time to listen. And if you've got value from this podcast, then it would mean the world to me if you rate and review it on Apple or Podchaser and share it with your community so that this work can impact more people. Because I'm on a mission to help people live a life free from constraints. And if you're ready to take this from information to transformation, then connect with us at thephilosophicalcoach.com.